Hello, and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest trends and developments in China's politics, economics, culture, and society. My name is Emily O'Brien, and I'll be your program moderator for today. On this episode of China Forum, we'll be discussing an important and complex topic, China's economy. Today, we have economist Dr. Yukon Huang with us to shed some light on this topic. Yukon Huang is a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment here in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining Carnegie, he was the World Bank Director for China. His research focuses on China's economic and financial prospects and its global impact, and he has published widely on development issues affecting China. He is also the A-list commentator uh, for the Financial Times on China, and his articles are seen frequently in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, CNN, New York Times, and Foreign Affairs. Dr. Huang has a PhD in economics from Princeton University and a BA from Yale University. Dr. Huang, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be here today. So let's just jump right in. Um, the People's Republic of China was formed as a communist country, as we know, but continued reforms since the 1980s mean the country's economy looks very different today than it did in 1949. How would you characterize China's economic system today? Well, 10, 15 years ago, people would be talking about China as a century planned economy and contrasting it with the market-led economies in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. China has evolved considerably over the last two, two, three decades. It's now more likely to be called a state-led capitalist system, and people would contrast this with a more market-led capitalist system. Two basic trends are occurring. It's become much more private-oriented. Private activity accounts for the bulk of activity, and activity is much more subject to market forces than in the past. China is becoming what we would call a more normal economy. It's subject to the kinds of market pressures we see in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It has become more globalized, it's linked with the global markets. Becoming a normal economy, however, is not necessarily easy. It generates risks, uncertainties, and that's what we see in the presses today, China trying to cope with all these uncertainties. Mm -hmm. On that topic, uh, earlier this year, international media called a lot of attention to China's economic growth in 2014, uh, which slowed to its lowest rate in decades. Um, but 7.4% is still quite impressive for a country of China's size. Uh, how significant would you say this slowdown is for China? Well, the world's been used to growth rates of 10% a year for three decades. Mm -hmm. So in that context, 74 seems incredibly low. Now, what really happened was during the global financial crisis, when the rest of the world, particularly in the West, growth was collapsing, China had a major stimulus program. It was growing at that time around 9%, 9.5%. A stimulus program actually caused growth to go to 10 or 11%. So rather than coming down gradually, it actually shot up. Mm -hmm. Now, so it has to gradually come down to more sustainable levels, not from 9.5%, but something above 10%. And they had to do this in a very short period of time. So this has been extremely disruptive. At the same time, there's been what I would call a surge in property prices, overbuilding in the construction sectors, excess supply. So you have this slowdown on top of a property adjustment, and what you see here is a very difficult economic situation. Difficult, but it's manageable. But China's long-term, medium-term growth rate, probably for the, for let's say, the next five to 10 years, is somewhere between six to 7%. And the question is whether it can sustain this growth rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, since last year, Beijing has actually been preparing for this slowing by asserting that slowed growth should be considered the new normal for China. Um, does this mean that they've accepted this slowdown, or what steps, if any, is Beijing actually taking to slow the slowdown? A 7% great rate um, for the foreseeable future in the next five years, let's say, would be actually very, very good. Even, even 6% would be good. Mm -hmm. The question is whether it's sustainable. Will it be achieved on its own without the need to push out a lot of credit? without artificial stimulus from the government. So the real question is sustainability and the quality of that growth. 10, 15 years ago, China grew at 10% or needed to grow at 10% because it had to employ a massive numbers of people coming from rural areas, mm -hmm. people leaving the state system, so it had to generate a lot of jobs. China's uh, population age distribution has changed. It's a rapidly aging economy. Therefore, the workforce is actually shrinking. So employment growth is not now or no longer the major objective. It's the quality, it's the increase in wages, it's more environmental sustainability. So the issue today is the quality and sustainability of growth rather than its level. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way for China to increase its growth again and get back up to those old levels, or is this really the new normal for China? Well, I think people are going to have to realize, and I think the Chinese leadership understands this, 
that today the growth is maybe 7%, but it's likely to go down to 6% over the next year or two. And the reason is it has to work off this excess construction, this excess property in the mm -hmm. country. So China, let's say a year or two from now, is growing at 6% a year. Can it get back up to 7? Or is it going to continue to slide down to 5, 4, and 3? So that's the real question. And the answer is it could, it could continue to grow at 6 and possibly even get it up back up to 7, but it has to increase productivity and has to do a series of reform measures in the fiscal system, mm -hmm. financial system. It has a major urbanization process underway. It has to do that more efficiently. It has to address problems with the state enterprises. It has to increase the efficiency and quality of its investment in infrastructure throughout the country. If it does all these, then it could continue to grow at, say, 6 to 7 percent sustainably for perhaps another 5 to 10 years. If it doesn't, it's very likely that the growth will continue to slide. Mm -hmm. You make a good point about the real estate. Um, that actually, you know, you go to China today and you see in the cities a lot of buildings, a lot of empty buildings, construction everywhere. Um, how do you see the real estate market progressing over the next couple of years? Well, there's clearly an excess supply. Mm -hmm. A supply problem is much worse in the secondary and smaller cities. It's a less of an issue in, let's say, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, the big mega cities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even in those cities, if you go further out, let's say 10 or 15, 20 miles, you see some of these apartments which are totally empty. Mm -hmm. If you go to other smaller cities, you see these so-called ghost towns, whole developments with no people. Yeah. Now, probably a half to two-thirds of these projects are not an issue. They probably will be inhabited over the course of the next year or two. Some of these, however, should never have been built. So those problem projects are going to cause a financial problem for those localities. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a year or two maybe to work off the excess stock. But China is 53% urban today. It's moving to 60 and potentially over the next two decades to 70% urban. So a lot of these excess, excess housing stock will be occupied, but it will take time. Now, meanwhile, prices of property in China have skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. They've gone up five, six, seven fold over the last 10 years. Here in the U.S., we would find this out, you know, incredible. How can property increase by 500, 700%? Doubling here in the United States would be seen as a problem. What people don't fully realize is that private property 10, 15 years ago was essentially non-existent. It was, you were not able actually to buy it. You were not able to develop it. So property prices have been rising rapidly because the value of land and private property is now becoming realizable in a new market economy in China. And this is very similar to what happened in Russia. Property prices in Russia went up a thousand percent over ten years mm -hmm. to European levels. China's levels are now comparable to other East Asian cities. Okay. On the subject of the reforms that you mentioned, actually, China's state-owned enterprises have long been cited as a source of trouble for Chinese economy. Um, why has Beijing been so reluctant to reform this system when everyone seems to agree that change is needed? Well, we have to realize if you go back ten or fifteen years ago, the state enterprises were a huge problem. They were not making a lot of money. They were a debt burden. They weren't generating productive jobs. So the leadership then, under Zhu Rongji, instituted a policy of basically letting go the losing companies and letting the, the, the better ones flourish. And that succeeded, actually. So the profitability of state enterprises improved rapidly until the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And that, during the crisis, a lot of money was pushed into these state enterprises. They increased their capacity but they couldn't sell this excess stock, and they're still trying to work it off. So profitability of the SOEs has fallen dramatically over the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. So what should the government do? There are two classes of state enterprises, those owned by the central authorities in Beijing and those owned by the localities. The localities tend to be more operating commercial and service kinds of activities. They tend to be less profitable. There's no particular reason why they should be state enterprises. Mm -hmm. Many of those probably should be sold off. But it's the centrally owned state enterprises, some of which, some of them operate in strategic sectors. Uh, they are very, very important. They're going to stay in the state sector. Some are not. So the government has to decide which is strategic and which are not, and to basically let go of those which are not. Now, however, there is a problem in philosophy in China that being big is very good. Mm -hmm. They're very keen on promoting innovation. They see that the the global leaders in terms of innovation tend to be very, very large companies. So in China, there's also this view that we cannot or we should not be letting go or breaking down very large SOEs because those are potential national champions. Mm 
I think this is going to be very difficult for China to resolve. Are these large SOEs going to be the leaders in terms of innovation technology in the future, or will they actually become a drag on the economy? Mm -hmm. And they haven't actually made that decision yet. Mm -hmm. On that note, um, after the slowdown was announced, uh, there were some rumors in the media that Beijing was moving towards restructuring these companies, but in terms of consolidation uh, rather than selling them off. Um, do you see this as a viable option? Well, out of the uh, so-called third plenum reform platform of two years ago, which set the agenda for this new leadership team, the proposal was that they would establish more diversified ownership structures for the large SOEs. Uh, they would bring in private interests, but they would maintain a minority shareholding uh, share of interest in these companies. They would separate the ownership from the performance functions in the hopes that these companies would flourish. However, I don't think this will naturally actually work. Uh, private uh, interests aren't interested in investing in these SOEs if they don't have particularly control. So I think mm -hmm. this particular problem has not been resolved. I, I, this is not yet an issue uh, that the government has seriously addressed. There are a lot of philosophical, political, ideological concerns affecting this question here. So I think this is probably the area where much more discussion is needed. Okay. Uh, Another huge problem for China, um, as we know, has been corruption. And you were a guest, actually, on our corruption panel um, a few weeks ago, which our viewers can watch on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'd like to revisit a topic that we did touch on briefly during the event. Uh, some Chinese have claimed that Xi's efforts to stamp out corruption in the government are only going to worsen the economic slowdown. Um, do you agree with that? Well, in the short term, it will have a depressing effect on economic activity. Um, the consequence of the fact that expenditures by enterprises or government officials, entertainment, activities, expansion is being slowed down. That has a negative effect on growth. And so the short-term effect is contractionary. The potential question is, the question is, what about the long term? Mm -hmm. Will this make the economy more efficient? Uh, will corruption be reduced? There will be less waste? Well, we have to go back to the question, has corruption been actually a negative factor in China's growth? Mm -hmm. Because the general presumption is corruption is negative or damages growth prospects. So the great irony here, here's a country where corruption has been serious. Corruption has been increasing a lot over the last several decades. How come it grew so rapidly? And the answer is that this is a system which has been geared to promotion of investment. Its officials in the provinces and localities, they're evaluated on the basis of whether or not they're able to generate more growth and activity. Those officials in some cases, they've been involved in rent-seeking corruptive activities. But those kinds of activities still have to follow the, the government's basic objective. How do I get this country going very rapidly? So corruption in China, the interaction between government officials and private entrepreneurs in production of activities tends to be slanted toward growth and production types of activities, whereas in other countries, corruption tends to retard growth. Mm -hmm. tends to retire activity. So China's had this particular difference. And then as the country grows rapidly, ironically, you have more money to share. Mm -hmm. So corruption continues to expand. So what is the problem? Well, there are several problems here. One of them is very fundamental. Corruption generates a sense of injustice, unfairness. The, uh, the political system loses credibility. And I think the president sees this. He recognizes that if he cannot deal or moderate these corruptive tendencies, the whole basis the justification of the Communist Party is, in fact, weakened. So this is very high on his agenda. Mm -hmm. So on the flip side of that, uh, like you said, in the long term, how might decreasing corruption actually aid the Chinese economy? Well, as you have a market-oriented economy, as it becomes much more dependent upon private sector activity, as you have more, more rules of law and the system becomes more streamlined, then corruption doesn't serve any particular useful purpose. It becomes a cost burden. As those who are actually engaged in corruption, rent-seeking activities, as they grow in power, as they gain wealth, they tend to be trying to preserve their status, which means they, they start to work in ways which prevents change, prevents reform from moving forward. Mm -hmm. Corruption in the early years, 10 or 15 years ago, under a heavily centralized system, you could actually argue that it made the system more efficient. You got around the rules. The rules are too oppressive, too burdensome. Mm -hmm. But now that you've eliminated some of these rules, now that you're no longer dependent upon the state to drive all activity, corruption doesn't have this kind of liberalizing force. It becomes a problem. And I think this is the issue for the future. Mm -hmm.
Now, as you said, President Xi has acknowledged that this is a serious issue for the government. In your opinion as an economist, is it even possible for Xi to eliminate corruption or at least decrease it significantly? Well, as you mentioned, every country has corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be less in developed countries than in poor countries. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's less in, in developed countries uh, compared to developing is that the institutions in developing countries are weaker. Mm -hmm. the, the rule of law is weaker, so corruption flourishes. For corruption to be moderated significantly in China, you have to address some systemic factors. You have to reduce the role of government in directing and owning resources. Because if they own the resources, and these resources are needed for growth and production, then corruptive activities come to play because private entrepreneurs need access to those resources in order to flourish. So you're going to have to moderate the balance between the state and the market. The second, you need much more transparency. The final way that society is able to deal with corruption is if it becomes revealed and publicized. And that requires a major change in the way that China looks at these kinds of issues. Lastly, you have to ask the question, how do I compensate state officials? They're running large companies, some of them the largest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. They're paid salaries which are a fraction of what it is in the West. They have government officials dealing with major kinds of issues. Can they uh, ensure that they behave uh, prudently and honestly? And one question is, if you hold them to high standards, you also have to ensure that they have reasonable lives and incomes and that they follow the law. These are very difficult, very difficult issues. It's going to take a generation, in fact, to deal with them. So do you think that doing th taking measures like raising salaries among these um, officials, employees, do you think that is a significant way we can aid corruption? Just raising the salaries won't do the trick. Mm -hmm. You also have to um, make sure that the system doesn't encourage it. And, and secondly, there's the question of punishments. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are they held to standards? Are they held accountable? And how do you reveal this? For example, getting officials to declare their income and assets is very, very important. Mm -hmm. If you start doing these things, you have to do these things, along with the fact of compensating officials and people in the state enterprises, uh, what I call reasonably fairly. One problem we have in a globalized world is that people can move, and the goods and things they do cross borders. So you have a situation where if they move or operate in a different country, and it returns to so-called skills and entrepreneurship is much higher, yet they're not being compensated accordingly, then you basically have a very easy situation in terms of moving toward corruptive activities. Mm -hmm. So taking uh, that international route, uh, China made headlines uh, this month with its propos proposal for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIB. Um, the United States then made headlines by refusing to join. Uh, without getting too technical, do you see this refusal as having any economic repercussions? Well, this is not an economic issue. The AIB is a regional uh, infrastructure investment bank. It's going to be financing bridges and highways and power plants, mm -hmm. improving communications in Asia. Does this affect uh, the U.S.? Not directly. Uh, because the United States is not a member, it may not be eligible for procurement contracts. It uh, may suffer a little bit in terms of trade flows, but it's not, it's not the big issue. Mm -hmm. The big issue is the geopolitical implications of this. By not being what I call publicly supportive, the U.S. sent what I think is the wrong signal, that it was not actually welcoming and encouraging more lending to developing countries in East Asia for infrastructure, infrastructure which would help them to grow more rapidly. And by growing more rapidly, of course, everyone benefits directly, indirectly. Mm -hmm. I think that was a mistake. I think it's good that uh, the U.S. has taken a step backwards. It now said it's willing to collaborate. It's becoming supportive. The World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, They've indicated willingness to collaborate. Uh, the founding members have expressed their concerns about making sure that the AIB follows the, the right standards. I use the word right because too many people have used the word highest standards. And they don't realize that the issue is not the highest standards. The issue is the right standards appropriate for these countries and the situations. And this is where the AIB can actually be helpful because even the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank their standards are being criticized and scrutinized as being inappropriate. And even internally with those, those institutions, they're trying to actually modify them. So this, by working with the AIB, the hope is that all the international financial institutions actually become more efficient and competitive.
From the U.S.-China relationship perspective, uh, last year the headlines focused on China's economy surpassing that of the United States. This year they're focusing on what the slowdown in China might mean for the U.S. economy. Um, obviously our two economies are irrevocably intertwined mm -hmm. at this point. How would you characterize the economic relationship between the two, and do you see it changing in the near future? Well, the headlines tend to focus first on who is the world's leading economy. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it in terms of straight dollar renminbi conversion rates, the American economy is still five, six, seven times as large as China's. If you measure in terms of purchasing power, the ability of Chinese to buy things, it's getting much closer. Mm -hmm. On the purchasing power comparison, people forecast that China is perhaps already the largest economy, or by certain calculations, is likely to be over the next four or five years. So I think the two concepts measure different things. One is basically the, the, how well off the country is. The second is its global impact mm -hmm. through trade, foreign direct investment, geopolitical power relations. And that's better measured, actually, by the market prices. And there, in that measurement, China has a long ways to go. So I think that these two concepts need to be understood in their own context. But the basic question is, is this a win-win situation in the sense that if China flourishes, America is better off? Or is it something like a zero-sum game? Mm -hmm. One benefits at the expense of the other. And the answer is growth trade is a win-win proposition. It's not the case where if I do better, you're worse off. If I do better, you will do better because we feed off of each other in terms of trade, investment, and jobs are generated because of demand from the growing incomes on the other side. China is the largest growing export destination for American producers. A growing middle class in China, which is going to be moving from 200, 300,000 people to four or 500,000 people, generates a huge market for consumer goods and particularly services. And services is where America's strength lies. And services is also the kinds of activities where there's a lot of restrictive barriers in China. And this is, I think, the subject of the BIT and other kinds of discussions, the Bilateral Investment Treaty. If China liberalizes its service sector, the U.S. stands to gain a lot. If China continues to grow and the middle class becomes much larger, there will be a lot of demand for precisely the kind of skills that Americans have. So a more dynamic and growing China is certainly in the interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. A growing and expanding U.S. is clearly in the interest of China because China is, in fact, its largest destination market for Chinese exports of manufacturing goods. There's a great de deal of, of synergism and comparative advantages between the two countries. The U.S. is a major exporter of agricultural products and soybeans. China is not an agricultural economy. It could benefit enormously from being able, and it is benefiting enormously, from the provision of these commodities into China. China is not yet a very highly skilled or technologically sophisticated service sector, mm -hmm. the U.S. is. China, however, is a very efficient manufacturing, labor assembly, production of commoditized consumer goods. These are two economies which are actually very complementary. Mm -hmm. And if they both basically look at it in this positive way, then I think there's a lot of potentially good consequences coming out of the next de decade. Mm -hmm. So off of that, uh, how do changes in the U.S.-China relationship affect the world economy as a whole? Well, there's tensions generated by concerns between China and the United States. They both have apprehensions about each other. These need to be dealt with. Um, the question about whether one is becoming the next or the leading economic power and the way it's framed in terms of competition is actually not the right way to look at it. They complement each other. The world is a lot better if they collaborate. Let me give you a very, very simple example. Uh, climate change. The two countries have agreed that they would be more supportive. Mm -hmm. But you could go down to the very question of producing more solar energy equipment, wind turbine engines. Here, in fact, there's a lot of friction. There's lots of, of complaints or appeals to the WTO about whether there's unfair competition. Mm -hmm. But here's an area where collaboration between the U.S., which has the most sophisticated technology in these areas, and China's massive manufacturing capacity, if they actually collaborate together, put together their skills, they could lower the cost of renewable energy globally so that everyone benefits. Mm 
So instead of trying to fight each other in these areas, mm -hmm. this is an area where the leadership says we should just get, get together. If we collaborate, we can actually address this problem much better than has been in the past. So, um, actually, on the economic or environmental subject, um, you know, obviously this has been uh, another area in which uh, President Xi has really been focusing. Um, however, there are con some concerns, as there always are, that um, you know, paying more attention to the environment would negatively affect China's economy, particularly the industrial sector. Um, do you see a path forward for that for China? T Ten years ago, uh, concerns about the environment would not have registered in the public. Mm -hmm. They're much more concerned about their jobs, their wages, growing very rapidly. Today, it's quite different. The people in Beijing or Shanghai, central big cities every, everywhere in China, they're worried about air pollution. They're worried about the fact that the waters, the rivers are no longer uh, can breed uh, edible fish or they cannot be used for drinking purposes. I would say that environmental concerns and degradation is elevated and become perhaps the biggest concern among the people. So there's this big change. This is why the leadership now addresses this or thinks this is a big issue has to address. One of the things it's been doing is closing down some of these coal-fired furnaces in the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. It's basically becoming much more rigid in enforcing standards. So I think that the mindset of the Chinese people have moved dramatically closer to the mindset of what occurs in the West in terms of environmental concerns, and you're going to see a change. Well, I think that's a great positive way to end things because, as it turns out, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Huang for joining us today and shedding light on this really complex topic. You've made it really accessible. I'm Emily O'Brien, and we'll see you next time on China Forum. is that there's a lot of discussion about political liberalization and they usually point to the Arab Spring or they look at Indonesia. And I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. If you're going to look at what's going to happen in China, look for rapidly growing economies with authoritarian regimes and ask what happened. Because that's China. These other regimes poorly, doing poorly, high unemployment, all sorts of problems that collapsed. But look for successful developing countries with authoritarian regimes, and then you find, of course, there aren't very many. But there is two in the region, South Korea and Taiwan economy. And I think the interesting thing is that they began political liberalization in exactly the same year, 1987, at exactly the same per capita income level, at exactly the same urbanization and service development. Now, I, I specialize, I, I cite those factors because it, it creates an eco-political system that generates some of these kinds of forces, and the evolution of political liberalization is internal to the party itself, which, of course, is what the Communist Party has set. So I think we're actually looking quite often at the wrong kinds of possibilities to look at what's going to happen in China. So you see China following the path, or at least it's arguably true, that it's following the path of Taiwan and South Korea, and we're just not quite there? Is that? No, I, I think we have to ask the question if, what are the parameters of China? This is not a, a, yeah. a as I say, other countries with corruption, growth is stalled. People don't have jobs, so we have foment something, right? This is not that. This corruption actually feeds into more growth. 